Today, we have a special guest, uh, Dr. Hani Al-Banna. Dr. Hani Al-Banna is the founder of Islamic Relief, 1985, before most of you were born. 84. 84. Oh, thank you. Yes. And uh, after that, Alhamdulillah, he left to leave space for the younger generation. And later on, mashallah, he established many other organizations. One of them is the Humanitarian Forum, the Muslim Charities Forum. So he's with us today. We have been discussing many things since uh, morning. And he would like to share some of his wisdom with us today here in Action for Humanity. So please listen carefully to what he says and feel free to ask your questions. Yes, Dr. Hen. Uh, Alhamdulillah, Ustaz Samar Rasulullah. Thank you very much for uh, allowing me to speak to you. Inshallah. Allow me to speak to you. It was an honor, it's an honor to be here today, second time. The first time was before COVID. Second time is today. Uh, I'm very happy to see the average age of everybody in the room is less than 30 years old, which is something which I should be very proud of it. You need to look behind you. <laughs> <laughs> I will take that age over 60. <laughs> I think when you keep quiet, we'll make it 30. <laughs> okay, Naim, alhamdulillah. Yeah. Uh, and this is the new challenge. The people who made the difference for Islamic Relief in the mid 90s were peeping at your age. You remember Harun, Atalla, Nasr Haj Hamid, Saleh Saeed, Khalid, uh, sorry, uh, Fadi Aitani, Anwar, uh, Jangir, Shaheen, and many made the difference. It was not me. Don't ever talk about one individual. Talk about the collective, especially when they are at the young age, being empowered, being motivated, being taking the place of the leadership. And this is what happened. Today, when I'm here, I'm celebrating not only the 40 years of the international humanitarian work of the Muslim community in the country, but the evolving of organizations. And actually, organization could be humanitarian, Developmental, social. Muslim Child's Forum had a research paper about the local organization led by Muslims. 45% uh, of them are led by Muslim women, not Muslim men. These are the local organizations in the country. And 40% of their fund were used by non-Muslim individuals. So this is the new diverse or diversity of the people who are leading the Muslim organization in the Greater Britain. And today we remember the journey which was started as Osman saying 1984 or maybe before 1984 by people were the first responders, who were amongst the unemployed, the taxi drivers, the labor force, the pensioners, Asian mainly, who started supporting this vision from Bangladesh, from India, from Pakistan, and some from the Middle East as well. We have to recognize those people, because without them, could not have been here today. I was very honored to be the first individual who used to hold a car, cardboard donation box and stand in front of the mosque to collect money after Eid prayer. So I'm very honored. I'm not honored by my doctor of medicine degree, even by the decoration given to me by the queen. I'm honored by being the first one to hold this box and say, Jaddi, Jaddi, Janda, Janda, what else? <laughs> <laughs> Speak uh, Bengali. 
Yeah. Say it in Bengali. What? Quick, quick. What? Quick, quick. 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 And this actually reminds us here today, 40 years ago, we did not have offices to sit inside, <coughs> not have tables like this, or chairs like this. We were on our foot all the time to go from door to door, from street to street, from shop to shop, from mosque to mosque. Even the churches used to give us money in the late 80s for actually our fund for uh, Sudan, for Bangladesh, Cyclone 1991, for uh, Sudan, flooding, for Iran, earthquake, for all these sorts of things. For the famine in Eritrea, 1983, actually before Eritrea became an independent from Ethiopia at that time, Tigray and Eritrea had a very severe famine and very badly affecting hundreds of thousands of people who crossed the border to Sudan at that time. And this is actually where Islamic Relief started its work after that. This journey, sisters and brothers, has to be recorded, has to be written, has to be taught to younger generation. The people who don't write their history huh, cannot make an impact on the current situation of the society that they're working at. The people who don't write their history will never be able to make the future for generations to come. Never ever. Invest in history, invest in philosophy, invest in identity, invest in culture, invest in values, invest in morality, and invest in proper media. Invest in advocacy as well. It's not only fundraising, it's not only programs. So it's only the money. Unfortunately, nowadays, we don't have the vision to invest in the five or six or seven uh, dimensions which I mentioned earlier. When I left the Islamic League, I left it for a new dream. I'm suffering for the last 14, 15 years with no big funding coming to us because we are talking about coordination, communication, networking, capacity building, conferencing, workshops, which is not on the agenda or on the radar of the donors, unfortunately. And sometimes organizations don't even believe in that. Say, oh, no, no, no. Feed, 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 feed. Your people in Syria, Sister... Uh, sister... Alva. 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 Your people. 2016, they were telling us, stop, ask people to stop them giving us food baskets. 2016, we want to be empowered. The woman was very clever, was very clever to become an independent. But actually, the policy of the donor sometimes change your status from being independent, productive individual to be on the receiving end. Unfortunately, and this could be a global direction of the international donors as well as well as the Muslim donors who said, only food for Ramadan, only clothes for Eid, only what they call it, school bag. Yes, we want this. <coughs> we want the, the community to be empowered. The word, uh, the name of your organization is Action for Humanity. Action is different to activity. Action means it's going to make the change. If your action does not make a change, you are not standing up to the quality of your name. See, what we are looking at for the Muslim sectors in the country is to be a partner with the greater sector in this country as well. And we have to do that, whether we like it or not. Research, sisters and brothers, is not on our table, unfortunately. Unfortunately. Why? are the other non-Muslim organizations, particularly Western organizations, are ahead of us. Because research is the base that they start to make the change through that. Because they believe in partnership. 
They believe in partnership. You look at something called SCHR. SCHR is a coalition of the largest international organization who sit down once or twice or three times every year to coordinate, including Oxfam, Save the Children, Plan International, uh, what else, World Vision, uh, Christian Aid, what else, and all those big, they don't need to sit down together, but they sit down together to think what we need for us to have the collective thinking, the collective vision, the collective direction, the collective impact, it should not be only me as Action for Humanity having the impact, it should be all of us having the impact. And that's why if we don't believe in research, if we don't believe in connection, communication, networking, we cannot make an impact on the community and we can become leaders of our society. And this is what I'm telling, I'm, I'm, I don't like to say telling, but I'm reminding myself and you to do. Actually, without this, Sister Shamila, Shamila, ah, you are the one who is giving me, um, I don't know how many messages you send me every day. You're on my broadcast, there's just a uh, brother of mine is as well and lots of others, so yeah. I, think that I don't send that many messages out these days. But I, I only remember your name, not anybody else. Alhamdulillah. Okay. And she's driving me. She's driving me and she's guiding me. And she's showing me the way. And it's how actually we respect women when they work with us in all our organizations. To cut the story short, the impact will never be made only by money or by publicity. The impact will be made by the individual who can make the change. By you as an individual, when people look at you, they feel safe. When people look at you, they feel happy. When people be with you, they feel protected. When people sit down and talk to you, they talk about their future. And when they are actually discussing things with you, they feel that they are saving them, that you are building their future. This is how the barakah or the blessing of Allah comes to all of us. Because of what? Because of the one whom we claim that we are serving. The young woman who became a widow at the age of 20, 25, as most of the Syrian women are. The young orphan, boy and the girl. The elderly, the sick, the bewildered, the displaced, the refugee. Those are the people whom we should stand up for because those are the people who are paying our salary. <coughs> our salary is not paid by action for humanity. Action for humanity cannot sustain itself without the support of the people that it claims that they are serving it, or it's serving it, which is the orphan, and the widow, and the destitute, and the displaced, and the victims of rape everywhere in this area. So really, sisters and brothers, today we have to remind ourselves that humanitarian work, charitable work, developmental work, is about human being. We have to treat human being as human being. We cannot afford, actually, to treat them as numbers of boxes, numbers of pairs of shoes, numbers of discs, chairs, tents, blankets. No, they are human beings. Human beings like us. Ask ourselves, what would happen to us if we were in this situation? If my, if my wife become a widow, and my children became orphans, and they're living in a tent. And the dream of one of the Syrian girls at the beginning of this year, my dream for 2022 is to have a new tent. Because the tent that we are living under it, on this roof, is khalas, and it's coming very old, and the rain is coming through. This was a dream. A dream of a child wants to have a pair of shoes. A dream of a child want to have 
uh, football to play with or to go to a school or to have a book or to have a pen or a pencil. This was a dream and still a dream of the people who they are paying our salaries. They are standing up to protect us. You know how they are protecting us, Sister Shamila? And every one of us? Because they make dua for us. They make dua for us. And I can conclude my uh, talk with you today. You remember Brother Sultan Abu Salman from Ithar? I keep saying this story wherever I go. This is a true story happened in UK. Sultan Abu Salman had a cancer in the throat. Very difficult to treat. Very difficult to treat. And he was in an intensive care unit. And the doctor came and told the mother, the wife and the daughter, well, as your husband is dying, you have to prepare him for that. The daughter, Suad, screamed at the face of the doctor. She said, my father is not going to die. Then one of the workers in Isar organization, Isar for Relief, isn't it? Isar Relief. Isar Relief, found the people in East Sudan, in some of the camps. You know what he told them? He told them, uh, no, uh, Sultan. Sultan is dying. Please pray for him. Miracles does not only happen at the time of Jesus, alayhi salam, the time of Moses, alayhi salam, or the time of Muhammad, alayhi salam, or the time of Abraham, when Allah changed the fire or the flame into a cool breathing for him, or the time of Noah. It happened. The people in the camp in East Sudan, were praying for Sultan from Zuhr, I mean mid midday, till the evening <coughs> prayer. Sultan is still alive up till now, 10 years after the dua, not after the medicine, not after the money, and you should bring him one day here. He'll be more powerful to talk to you about his experience. My experience is just talk show. But his experience is the life show and the life experience of him. And Sultan Abu Salman, now 10 years, he is alive. And one of his children became a doctor, qualified and married recently. His daughter has a master's degree and, 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 and. From refugees, family who came from Eritrea, which was a part of your country. I love Ethiopia. Maybe more than you love it. Because <laughs> Ethiopia is my mother. And whenever you go anywhere, they tell you Jesus is from Ethiopia. <laughs> no, Adam, no, not, not Jesus. Adam. 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 Thank you, thank you. Adam. Everybody from Ethiopia. Life was started in what? In Addis Somewhere where? Somewhere in Ethiopia. Somewhere in Ethiopia. <laughs> Ethiopia. <laughs> okay. Even Queen of Sheba. Called Queen of Sheba. She is it, is it, no, okay. Okay. So really remember the story of, of Sultan and remember the story of the people who protect us. The more we are with the people, the more we become protected. I can stop now, so if you want to ask any question, ask me any question because you think that's stupid or uh, unrelevant. Because yesterday I was talking about how one day I was going to be the cause of closing down Islamic Leaf in 1995 because of my mistakes. So don't worry about asking me. So I don't like to because you are not stupid people. Don't 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 actually stop asking me any question which is strange, or somebody can see it as stupid, or even <coughs> private. Because once you are in this field, you are a public figure. Sometimes, some words, somehow, somebody told others that Dr. Elbanna is our public finger. You know public finger? <laughs> <laughs> he was supposed to be saying public figure, but he said public finger. <laughs> anyway, now I'm open for discussion. Yes, guys, thank you very much, Dr. Hani. Uh, please feel free to ask. Yes, ladies first. God, Dr. Shamila. Dr. Shamila? Uh, what was, what was, what impacted you most in 
your entire very illustrious illustrious career in humanitarianism. Well, it's not a career, it's a life in uh, humanitarianism, but what really impacted you the most? Any certain um, encounter with maybe a refugee or um, somebody that was displaced, something that really impacted you that you even think of now? Yes, years later. I think how my life has been changed. This was 1982, Forest Army. Because of three incidents happened. The first incident was from your country. What happened in Hama in February 1982. I was a young doctor, just starting my job. And even I was not married yet. Uh, this is number one. Number two was the massacre in Sabra and Shatila in Lebanon, yes. which was discovered by a French journalist, incidentally, and became like a big news. This was all 1982. Number three was the my visit to Bosnia in actually 1982. When I was traveling back from my first holiday to Egypt to see my family after getting my my license to work as a medical doctor in UK, I stopped in Bosnia, which was Yugoslavia at that time. And I saw Sarajevo before the war. And I was exposed to the young university students from the Middle East who was, were telling me how the communist <coughs> socialist regime torturing Muslims, including Dr. Ali Aizabegovic, Rahmatullah Ali. These three a wake up call in 1982 made me to think seriously in 1983 when the famine in Eritrea and Tigray happened, what to do next. It's a preparation, Sister Shamila. It's a preparation. You know what happened to me? I was sitting my uh, membership exam as a pathologist. And I was waiting at the same time for the leaflets of uh, talking about Sabra and Shatira massacre in Beirut. For a week before the exam, I was calling people in London, Dr. Abu Majid Khatman. Mm -hmm. Where's the leaflet? Where's the leaflet? Where's the leaflet? It's coming to you. On Friday, before the exam, which said them was Monday, I was busy. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, not revising my exam paper, but distributing the leaflet from door to door, from mosque to mosque, from street to street, from shop to shop. Of course, I passed. I failed under the exam. <laughs> but my failure to become, to have the, 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 the the membership yeah. made me to shift to the humanitarian work. So you haven't done it again? No, I, I did the MD afterwards, which is the doctor of medicine yeah. from, uh, from the medical school. So this was the three spotlights in 1982, which let me shift. Yeah. Uh, and still, still like a fingerprint or like an impression in my heart and my mind and my soul, Sabra and Shatira, Hama and Bosnia. And if you look at them, Sabra and Shatira in Lebanon, Hama in Syria, Bosnia in Europe. And actually made, see, made me to think about my future. But well, we always, the, whatever is meant for you can never miss you, and whatever is going to miss you can never reach you. No. Uh, and this is really uh, the fact that you failed the exam, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put you on a course that then had such far-reaching impact. This is only in his great plan for you and, and for all of us. Sometimes we, 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 one door closes and we're, if we're stuck behind this door thinking, why did the door close? Why did the door close? You can't see that there's another door that opened here or here. And that takes you to a different path. And our challenges and our trials, of course, shape us, galvanize us, strengthen us, so that we can strengthen others. That's my experience too. Is this, not, this is not my first failure. Oh yes. Oh, Many worry. times. Yeah, yeah. Same, Even same. I was uh, <laughs> proposing... Yeah, to I mean, your wife? To many women. <laughs> <laughs> You're opening a can <laughs> of worms here. 
No, 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 not no, no, individually. Yeah, yeah. Individually, yeah, yeah. I was refused. Yeah, yeah. Till Allah right told person. me, she is the right one, and she is real as the right one. This is number one. Even with my doctor of medicine, as a, in my thesis, I failed, major failure. But it Alhamdulillah, uh, major. It was a major failure because of the English correction, English <laughs> language, because of not 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 controlling the references. But actually, the amount of work you have done for your thesis gave you shafaat. Exactly. And actually, it was it was actually giving me the chance uh, to 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 write to rewrite my thesis again. So, brothers and sisters, failure is not failure. Failure is a trial for success. It's a chance for success. If you fail, so what? If you do something, so what? If you become the second or the third or the fifth, so what? Keep trying. Keep trying, keep trying, even if you try hundreds or more or thousands of times. Because the, the Nobel Peace Prize winners in chemistry, in physics, in science and technology, they have tried their experiments thousands and thousands of times. You see, Webb, uh, uh, James Webb Telescope. You know, the Americans started in the 60s. America has the resources, had the knowledge, had the vision, had the technology. It took them 60 years to build this telescope. How many times they failed during this journey of the 60 years? Till they managed to bring this telescope and this telescope is the one who is showing the whole world, the universe, what Allah written in the Holy Quran 1400 years ago or more. We should have deserved to make the James Webb telescope ourselves, but the American did it. They deserve to be recognized and they deserve to be, يعني, that we can take our hat off for the American because of the achieving. But the good thing about the James Webb telescope is they remember the first man who started the journey in the 60s, James Webb. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Any other uh, question? Yes, I have a question. Dr. Hani, Jazakallah uh, for everything. And uh, uh, it's, uh, for us, it's always been an honor that you are here. Uh, and we always learn from you. This is the time when I was working in Islamically Pakistan 2010. You were there during 2010-11 uh, uh, floods 2012 as well. So uh, I have seen so, like uh, so many times you have been discussing and then your speeches. I've seen so many in your videos as well on YouTube about uh, the collaborative action that you talk about. Yes. Uh, the partnerships and joining hands. Yeah. Uh, which is like uh, on papers we usually see that is it's very common when every other organization either be World Humanitarian Action Forum or MCF they talk about collaborative action but what I have seen unfortunately within this uh, within this sector um, the Muslim organization I have not seen that action uh, that as compared to the other organizations, which are the mainstream organizations, the Western organizations, they join hands for some some cause. But here, we what I have felt that uh, they, these big giants, uh, starting from Islamic Relief or Muslim Aid or other organizations, they they consider themselves as their competitors, rather than like joining hands and doing color, uh, some collective work for for some cause. Uh, because I have personally felt that and experienced as well uh, that uh, they are not willing to work together and they uh, feel like in a way that how can we work with this particular resident and this is our competitor. Mm -hmm. So with your experience that just in the time that you have left Islamic League, you have been a very strong supporter of partnership that I know. So, but still a lot to do yes so just wanted to know that what is the main issue that why the mindset is uh, not being changed 
maybe uh, I think nowadays after it's not, Muslim Chess Forum started nearly 15 years ago and happy to say that Alhamdulillah I'm stepping down from the chairmanship and this was a request from myself more than three years ago maybe four years ago and to find uh, another one who is far more better than myself and uh, very well connected than myself and Alhamdulillah and the journey is going we struggle because the mindset of the people who lead the Muslim charitable sector we struggle because of some of what you have said we struggle because some of this organization are still attached to groups and the groups are advising them go here or not to here يعني ايه with remote control control we struggle sometimes because some of the leadership are not to the standard of the partnership quite often i fight with the ceos i tell them you are not managers you are directors the director has to sit think direct not to sit manage and penalize or give reward to somebody else quite often some of our directors ceos are still acting as managers unfortunately not as real leaders and this is where actually we suffer we uh, suffer because there's no much succession planning we do not invest in younger people like yourself when the one day maybe Uthman can maybe in in certain time maybe in 10 years or whatever it is when the organization established he can go and do something else and some of you could take up the leadership alhamdulillah it happened to me 14 years ago but when I left, maybe brother, uh, what's his name, Naim mm. Raza, knows that because he was there. There was at least a dozen, or more than a dozen of people can take the leadership in the organization. That's what my advice to Osman and to Asim is to prepare you, actually, for what we call the succession planning. And become a director, and becoming a CEO, and become a trustee, and even sending you to other organizations to benefit from the expertise that you learned while you were here in uh, Action for Humanity. I say, what we fail at, brothers and sisters, is we don't build our younger generation inside the organization. The young leadership. This is something which is very important. Like, what's your name, sister? Jess. Jess. Jessica. Okay, Jessica, could she, could, she, could she become the CEO of Action for Humanity in 10 years' time or more? Can we prepare Jessica or Shamila or Fatima or others? You see, that's, that's what you need. That's what Osman needs to look at the potential of everyone in the organization. That's why we ask the trustees to let Osman not to be executive director, but actually to be director and 50 to 60 percent of his time to think about you to think about the future of the organization think about the direction but if Osman will be actually deeply entrenched to in the executive role every day he will never be able to not only Osman it's most of the most of the CEOs of the organizations of the Muslim charities they don't sit down unfortunately and have a back seat and look at everyone oh yes What's your name? Amin. 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 Amin could be a director. Of finance. <laughs> yeah. Of finance. Of finance, of finance. Okay. I mean one day, like Yunus like, is not here, yeah? Yunus is not. Okay. You see, you see, this actually when 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 I take a back seat, you remember I remind, I remind you of an ayah from the Quran. Falaula nafra mun kulli firqatin ta'ifatun. This ta'ifa, this small group among the many, has to sit down at the back. And this was sometime we call it in UK, the establishment. The establishment in this country is different to the government. The establishment are, could be the church, could be the palace, could be thinkers, 
could be think tanks, could be individuals who have got this knowledge, like one of them globally called uh, uh, in America, uh, Henry Kissinger. If he was in UK, he would be a part of the establishment of thinking, actually, for the future. So what we ask the trustees to rewrite the job description of the CEO and tell him to have 60, 50, or 70% of his time to do these things, to move the organization forward, to grasp opportunity, to uh, train and mentor the younger generation, to connect uh, to find uh, a way to protect her and, 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 and. She should not sitting in the, be sitting in, in actually the Office of Action for Humanity or Islamic Relief or Muslim Hands or Muslim... These are the fashions. It's Gone with the Wind. If, have you seen Clark, Clark Gable in the movie Gone with the Wind? Have you seen it? Metro Golden Meyer. Have you seen it? I saw it in the 60s. Clark Gable yeah. was very handsome. Have you not seen it? He's not from this so country. Sheltered. He's asking <laughs> him, not me. <laughs> I saw it in Cairo in, 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 in the 60s. 60s. Then, yeah. But actually, it was, it was it came to Cairo in the 60s, but it was before that. Uh, yeah, it's classic. And I can't remember the, the ladies or the stars. Shamila. Uh, I, I, I can remember faces. I never remember faces. I was talking yesterday about uh, the communication. I just I concluded with this. And they said, in 1972, Marlon Brando wanted to uh, become the star of Godfather 1. You know what he did? He invested from his own pocket $20,000 to go to a, a, a makeup artist to make his face and put his clothes and go there. And when he went there to, to be in, interviewed by the director, this is the one I want. Yeah. Twenty thousand pound, sorry, dollar, not pound, in nineteen seventy two. So we did Godfather one and Godfather two. Then I came as Al Pacino. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the nineteen ninety two Godfather, the nineteen ninety nine Godfather. But actually, look at the vision of an artist or an actor like actually this Yanni star or superstar called Marlon Brown said, I want to achieve this, I pay from my pocket. He might have been given maybe millions of dollars later on for his, for his actually uh, leading role in the, in, the, in the success story of Godfather. So you have to make Marlon Brando in the MIT work. You have to make Messi and the Cristiano Ronaldo and Muhammad Salah and what else in, 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 in the MIT work. The superstar, but you have to make them yourself. You have to invest in them. You have to tell the trustees that we need to invest in the younger generation, in women and men, in Muslims and non-Muslims. It doesn't make any difference. Leaders, see, you know, because most of the messages, Islam and Quran, about helping, is helping, okay? Helping others. Helping mainly Humanity. anybody, anybody and everybody. There's no miskin which is needy, Muslims are Muslims. The miskin is a miskin. The needy is a needy. Whether he is Muslim or non-Muslims. Because in this situation, don't talk about religion. Save his life or her life. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, online, guys, any question? Online? Yeah, but, assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Go first. Shazid, on you go. Do you want me to go first? Yeah, bismillah. Bismillah. Uh, uh, thank you for your time, um, um, sorry, um, so I think my question was just regarding what you were saying just now, I think what I've, from my experience and what I've seen in the Muslim charity sector, the, the head of the organization basically has all the power, and I, my question is basically how do you think the subordinates or people like underneath him can basically try and influence this person to give that power and authority uh, to his subordinates? Because that's very common in the, in the Islamic uh, charity sector, from what I've seen. Yeah, this is happening. Uh, I think uh, Action for Humanity is doing it through Nasser Haj Hamid and Nasser Rafiq in the governance. They can put in the structure, the terms of reference, and maybe the period of the CEO 
or the chairman of the board or the board membership for how long. And this kind of succession planning has to be put from the very beginning. I don't like you calling yourself subordinate. It's, it's very humiliating wording. <laughs> young, you can, you, you can say you call, you call yourself younger leader. Younger leader, whether you are Muslim or non-Muslim, does not make any difference. You have to have a chance. Otherwise, you will walk out. Otherwise, you will run away. And that's it. The organization has to be considering itself like an academy. A star academy. Star academy and producing young humanitarian leadership. Yeah, we have Dr. Ami changed the constitution. Yes, alhamdulillah. So now tell, tell trustees them. can serve only uh, two or for three. two terms, three years, max for two terms. And yeah. every term even, the board needs to approve the second term. See? So this That's is already right. well ahead. It's happening. It's happening. It's ha it might not be happening in all the organizations, but at least it's happening Islamically. It's happening in uh, Action for Humanity. Yes. It might be happening in other organizations as well. Naim. Doc, Assalamualaikum. Alaikum Assalam, Brother Naim. It's not only been a pleasure to work with you, learn from you, to actually live with you. I think out of all the people here, I'm the only person that's actually lived with you, alhamdulillah, for uh, a number of years. Um, Doc, where do you think, what's the, the landscape going to look like in the coming, you know, there's been so many different waves, charities who are making money just on deployments, and some are just doing events, some are online. Obviously, we have the cost of living crisis. Uh, where do you think things are going to go in the next three to five years? How is the landscape going to change in the charity sector? If you look at the coming three to five years, I have to be realistic, maybe optimistic, pessimistic. We might face a third world war. We don't know. We might face it. We might face it. The way... If you're in Scotland, Scotland and England. No, 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 no. No, you know what I'm talking about. The Ukraine war is not a joke. Mm. Russia is not a joke. Sorry. Okay, Russia is not a joke. Uh, the reason for the First World War was somebody shot some prince in Sarajevo. Sorry. Sorry. The Second World War as well, and so on. So we are facing, we could be facing, unfortunately, this. We are facing a fuel crisis and actually gas crisis. We have to stand up and live together and stand to this, what is the alternative? This is the second, second point as well. Mm. That might be for the local, for, for your organization, might shift in actually helping the local community more than they were doing it before. And they might try to say, let us save our community in UK, in, uh, in, uh, in Germany, in Switzerland, as well as we try to help the people overseas. This might become in the, in the chain. The second thing, actually, which we'll look at, to be very honest, mature organization, like the Muslim organizations, has to believe, have to believe that you cannot do it alone. You will never be able to do it alone. Partnership is the cornerstone. No matter who you are. That's why I'm talking about SCHR, which includes World Vision nearly, nearly $4 billion. What is the budget of the Cox Farm International, or Save the Children International, or actually Plan International, or Care International? Find on this group, which is about 12 or 13 organizations, maybe $30 billion. But they sit down together to talk to one another. They, they, they put the policy for the humanitarian sector globally as well. We have to, well, by, by, by hook or by crook, whether we like it or not, to believe in partnership, communication, networking, uh, succession planning, uh, investing in local community, investing, empowering the local community in Syria, in Yemen, in Somalia, because they have to be independent one day. They can't keep feeding the people all the time. We have to empower them. We have to become, uh, make them economically empowered. This is what we need to look at, the new direction. Treat the local community where we work as partners, but as actually subordinate, as a brother uh, Shazib was talking about. No, uh, as good as we are, and with the case of Syria, a lot of women are more motivated and qualified than many women in the middle of Europe and America. Education. And education could be different kind of education. Don't go to stick to one side of education. Education now become very diverse, multidimensional. 
community education, vocational education, and others as well. And the last question, who do you think is going to be the new Prime Minister? It's you. Jazakallah <laughs> khair, Allah bless, Allah keep you in good health, a long life. May you continue to inspire us for generations to come, inshallah. Dr. Hani, thank you very much. We have, I think, our team, our younger team, has benefited a lot from you today. And benefited. we hope to do, inshallah, regular uh, meetings with you. As you can see, and I have explained to you in uh, this morning and in another occasions, that, alhamdulillah, we have a very young team, even our trustees, and the changes, we change the constitution, we have major changes within the organization. And in our business model, partnership and localization are main two factors in our business model. Uh, so thank you very much again for your visit. And inshallah, we'll continue the discussion to benefit from your wisdom to have a, a really a, a unique model within the charities here in the UK. I think we have a lot to give even to other charities. We try to support small charities as well. Amen. When we, whatever we develop and improve, we give it sadaqa as well to Amen. other charities. So Amen. our doors are always open for others to benefit and to exchange and to work, to work with us. So thank you very much, Dr. Hani, and hope, inshallah, to see you and to continue this discussion, inshallah, inshallah, with you.